Hello everyone and welcome to this week's edition of the Furs, Feathers and Fangs Creature Feature, a weekly series in which I talk about some of the amazing animals we get to share this planet with. Now last week we talked about spiders, my least favorite animal of all time. So I figured the only way to not only keep the Halloweeny theme, yeah, Halloweeny, the Halloween theme going and bring balance back to the system is to go from my least to my absolute most favorite animal of all time, the wolf. I have been fascinated with wolves my entire life. Their social structure, their hunting ability, their intelligence, and come on, they're, they're just a big furry dog. One that could potentially rip your throat out, but they're the ancestor of the dog, so how can you go wrong with that? Wolves are predatory animals in the canine family, largest of the canine family that also includes the domestic dog, jackals, coyotes, and foxes. Now, wolves are also one of the most highly dispersed predatory animals, as they inhabit North America from Alaska down into Northern Mexico, across Asia, Russia, into Europe, and even parts of Africa have wolves. Now, when most people think of the wolf, they think of the gray wolf. It is the iconic, majestic animal that we know as a wolf, but there are also subspecies. For example, North America has the red wolf that inhabits the east and south of the United States. Much smaller, closer in size and appearance to a coyote, but still a subspecies of the wolf and one of the most endangered wolves that there is on Earth. Wolves can inhabit a variety of different habitats from forests to grasslands, to scrub, mountains. The only places you won't find wolves are true deserts, very, very high mountains above tree lines, and in tropical rainforests. Wolves are very social animals, which is evident in the way that they hunt, the way that they raise cubs. Without having the social structure of a pack, wolves would cease to exist. Now this strong social drive is what made it easy for primitive man to accept the wolf into our clans and our tribes and integrate it into our society. Humans are social, wolves are social, and over generations, we changed the wolf into the dog, but kept this strong social drive. Wolf packs will not only help each other hunt, and bring down much larger prey than an individual wolf could, but they also help in the rearing of cubs born to the alpha male and the alpha female in the pack. It is a common goal, and they know the importance of raising little wolves into big wolves, that all of them, male and female, will help participate in the rearing of cubs. Now, not all females in the pack will breed, as I said, only the alpha male and female will. And it doesn't have so much to do with um, with a hierarchy as one would think. It's really more in the sense that the alpha male and female are usually the strongest and the healthiest. And it's just better to pass on those genes rather than a weak or sickly animal. Interesting fact about wolf pups when they are born, their eyes are completely blue. And at around one month old, they change to brown, yellow, even a dark green sometimes. If you've never seen a baby wolf, Google it. You won't be disappointed. Wolves being social animals, they need a way to communicate long range. And that is where the iconic wolf hell comes into play. I, I guess I could, Quimby. Satisfied? Good. <laughs> now that howl, when coming from a wolf, not coming from yours truly, can carry up to six miles. And it is used to keep connections with other, me other members of the pack. And it can also be used to deter other wolf packs from coming into their own territory. Wolves can have a territory of anywhere between a hundred to a thousand square miles. That is a lot of ground to patrol. So being able to vocalize 
whose territory you're in is very valuable. And it's a lot better than having to patrol those borders every single day of your existence. Trust me, I come out here and I walk and I do a video and I'm feeling it. Now, as far as actually moving about their territory, wolves can, well, they can move. <laughs> they can run up to 40 miles an hour, but they can only maintain that speed for a short while, similar to cheetahs. But if they run at a slower speed, between anywhere between five and 15 miles an hour, they can keep that pace nearly all day. Wolves have incredible endurance and that plays a factor in their hunting. If a pack of wolves is hunting something large, like a moose or an elk, they will keep just close enough to keep the moose or the elk running. And this actually goes to show how smart wolves are as well because they can actually plan ahead and, um, and create a strategy for hunting big game. They can run and they will chase, let's use the moose as an example. They will chase the moose down a predetermined path and every so often the wolves will change out. The two or three that started the chase will tag out, I guess, and they will switch with other members of the pack that are waiting along this predetermined route. And they can run, going in circles like a, uh, like a dinner time relay. And they eventually, they will tire out the large prey item. And when the moose is to the point of exhaustion, it'll collapse. And that's when the wolves will come together and they will finish the job. Not pretty, but incredibly efficient and pretty darn smart for animals that don't have as big a brain as people do. Then again, I know some people that aren't quite as smart as they should be. Moving on, because wolves hunt in packs, the variety of prey that they can go after is a lot more varied compared to some other predatory animals. They can hunt anything from mule deer, so all of you guys that are somewhere out there, watch out. They can also hunt elk, moose, bison, musk, musk oxen, excuse me, and other large prey items like that. Hunting large prey items has a couple of different advantages for the wolf. One, it ensures that every member of the pack will have enough to eat, not only for that day, but the second advantage is, say a pack of wolves does bring down something the size of a bison, the size of a bison, excuse me. That means that they can return to that kill for days, maybe even weeks, after they bring it down. Meaning that they won't need to hunt as often so they can conserve their energy. It's really, it's a good system. No wonder they've kept it for the past five or six million years. Now when wolves do sit down to a kill, sit down, lie down, stand around, something like that, they can consume, an adult wolf can consume as much as 20 pounds of meat in a single sitting. That is the equivalent to yours truly, gulping down a hundred cheeseburgers. Not to say that, I mean, I, I guess I could if I wanted to. I really can't. It's. Another fun fact about dinner time for the wolf pack. When wolf pups are being weaned off of their mother's milk, adult wolves will consume meat from their kill. They will swallow it, partially digest it, and then go back to the cubs and they will regurgitate this ABC meat. It doesn't sound very appetizing, but it is a smoother transition for the pups that they are getting a softer, more appropriate version of the deer that might have been brought down. Easier for them to go from drinking milk to eating protein. By being such effective hunters, wolves do a great service to the ecosystems in which they live. They help control the population of herbivorous hoofed animals that would otherwise, their populations would balloon out of control 
and they would literally eat themselves out of house, of, a house and home. So in places where wolves have been eradicated, they have real issues with deer and elk populations just going bonkers and getting way out of control. And in turn, that is leading to not as, much, not as many resources for the elk or deer that still live there. So in an effort to balance things out, wolves have been reintroduced into areas that they once roamed. And the effects were almost instantaneous. Wolves got established, elk and deer populations went down, everything came back into balance. As far as interaction with humans have gone, has gone, Wolves have been part of our culture for tens of thousands of years. Um, cave paintings have been found in southern Europe dating back to about 20,000 years ago that depict wolves hunting um, other animals. Other good examples of this integration of the wolf into human culture, Viking warriors would wear wolf pelts into battle hoping to take on the ferocity and the fighting ability of the wolf. Similar to how they would wear bear skins if they wanted to take on the strength and abilities to fight of a bear. Um, ancient Greeks and Romans believed that dried wolf liver would aid in stomach and kidney problems when consumed. I don't, I can't vouch for the effects of that. I have never partaken in dried wolf liver myself. Other notable references to wolves in, I guess you can say pop culture, in the Game of Thrones universe, House Stark, which controls the north of Westeros, their house symbol is that of a snarling wolf head. Another great example, one that kind of ties into more of the Halloween season would be the werewolf. Now, for those of you who don't know, a werewolf or a lycanthrope is a human that is able to change his form into that of a wolf or a wolf-like monster. And depending on where the legend comes from, when it comes from, it'll either be connected to the cycles of the moon or the individual can do it at whim or the individual will wear something known as a wolf belt that allows them to turn into a werewolf as long as they are wearing that wolf belt or wolf girdle. Legends of werewolves go back for hundreds of years, mostly coming out of Europe, but nearly every culture has some variation of the werewolf. Apparently people are still hunting Pokemon out here. I thought the whole Pokemon Go craze had like kind of faded away. Apparently not. Getting back on the subject of werewolves, for hundreds of years there were people that were accused and persecuted and even executed. There was a whole series in the 16th and 17th centuries of werewolf trials similar to the Salem witch trials in which people usually panicked and in a state of mass hysteria would search out people that they thought were cursed by being a werewolf and it was it was pretty ruthless you either confessed to being a werewolf and were executed or you were you denied it and you were tortured until you confessed and were executed there were no winners in that scenario and interestingly enough, it wasn't just men, but women and even children were subject to being executed if they were believed to be a werewolf. And a very sad new suggestion states that children who have a condition that we as modern society knows as autism were believed to be werewolves because sometimes they would exhibit animal-like behavior which we now know isn't any form of 
werewolf curse or demonic possession. It's just something that happens to, to people. But very, very sad nonetheless. Another um, way that people would be accused of werewolves is if they exhibited cannibalism. No civilized man would consume the flesh of another human, right? So it often led to the execution of what we now call serial killers. And similar to Jeffrey Dahmer, even hundreds of years ago, serial killers would consume the flesh of their victims out of either some sense of satisfaction or to help dispose of the evidence. So, I guess side note, the werewolf trials did lead to the execution of some really bad serial killers. I should have filmed it, but I didn't want to disturb them. I just passed Mama Deer and her twins again, and they are getting pretty darn big. And I had a really pleasant conversation with an older lady about how awesome it is to have this nature area and to see deer and how they're just relaxed. So it's awesome. Every once in a while, strangers can make the best conversation. Keep that in mind, folks. Nowadays, something really just spooked the squirrels. Could it be a werewolf? Probably not. <laughs> Nowadays, there is no werewolf hysteria, so there is no mass persecution of wolves because not only did it lead to the deaths of a lot of innocent people, but wolves all over Europe and North America were slaughtered for fear that they would transmit the werewolf curse. And persecution of wolves like that has gone on even into the modern day. Um, there are still places where wolves come into contact with ranchers and people that are pushing further into their, their territories. And in the 1920s, there was even a federal act enacted by the US government called the Wolf Eradication Act because they were viewed as a pest and not a valuable part of the ecosystem. And by the 60s and 70s, wolf populations, not only in North America, but all over the world, were decimated. In fact, to this day, there are no wolves in Ireland, in England, uh, much of mainland Europe. The only places that in Europe that still have populations of wolves are Italy, and they have about a hundred. Spain has about 2,000 of them. In Sweden and Norway combined, there are 80 wolves. And that's really sad. In North America, in the lower 48, we have about 3,500, including some that have recently moved back to California, the Shasta Pack, which I'm really excited about. In Canada, their numbers are a little stronger. There are about 30,000 there. And in Alaska, the last great stronghold for the wolf in North America, as far as the United States goes, there are about 5,000. But the biggest population of wolves in the modern day is in Russia. And there are roughly 70,000 there that are still going strong thanks to how expansive and remote much of the Russian wilderness is. But thanks to conservation efforts and increasingly protected statuses, wolves are making a comeback everywhere. Despite the pressures of habitat loss and competition with ranchers over their livestock. Interestingly enough, in 1975, when the Endangered Species Act was enacted in the United States, the very first animal to be placed on that list was the gray wolf. So we knew then, what we know now, that wolves were valuable and they were worth protecting. Not only as custodians of their ecosystems, but just because they are amazing and, dare I say, majestic animals. <laughs> and it's really, it's really amazing what a little conservation can do. Because like I said, there are wolves now in areas where they haven't been 
in decades. So hopefully that good work will continue and there will be wolves for future generations. Well, everybody, that's about all the time that I have for today. I hope you've enjoyed this creature feature on my favorite animal, the wolf. Is it your favorite animal as well? Leave a comment down in the section below. Let me know what you think. If you have any questions, drop one of those down there as, as well. I will be more than happy to spill forth my knowledge on the great majestic gray wolf or red wolf, either one. If you like this video and want to see more videos like it, go ahead and click the box up here. That'll take you to more creature features. If you want to see other videos from this channel, click the box down below that. That'll take you to my wild excursion playlist. Quimby, would you also show them where they can subscribe? Thanks, buddy. If you want to follow us, go ahead and like Furs, Feathers, and Fangs on Facebook at facebook.com slash Furs, Feathers, Fangs. This has been Zach. Thank you for joining me for the wolf creature feature. Have a wild day, everyone. <laughs>